So today you're going to meet some very unique individuals, some go-getters, some doers, success stories, remarkable stories. But first we're going to hear from someone who has a message for all of them. And they don't make them like Don Flo anymore, so listen up, 40 under 40s, all right? It's one thing to be a successful car dealer in this changing world, and it's another to be constantly asking the question, how can I make my business better? How can I reinvent myself? How can I make the future look brighter? And that's an appropriate setup for a guy who will spend this lunch hour talking about the past a little bit, more importantly, providing his tips to our 40 under 40s in terms of building a better future. And Don Flo is a perfect mentor for our under 40 recipients today. Yes, Don has skillfully mastered the business of retailing. Yes, he has circumnavigated the challenges of a changing model. And yes, he's thinking about you, the next generation. So this is a bit of a special treat. You know, Don is not exactly ubiquitous on the speaking circuit. Before his appearance at our retail forum in Chicago last fall, the last time he spoke to a group this large was about a decade ago. So there's a reason why. Don is all about operations, innovation, and excellence in his 36 franchises in North Carolina and of, of Virginia. As the chairman and CEO of Flow Automotive Companies, he leads a team that is continually striving for a better consumer experience and improved operations. He's a doer, he's a thinker, and he's one of the most respected minds in the auto retail business. To talk directly to our 40 under 40 honorees, please welcome Don Flo. So Jason, thank you for those very kind words and generous words. And to everyone who's gathered here, I have your first Las Vegas tip for you. If you ever see Jason Stein walking towards you with this warm, welcoming smile, run. <laughs> if you see his name pop up on your phone, do not answer it. Because Jason may be the most persuasive person on the planet Earth. You know, he has some kind of magic power he puts over you that when you try to say no, you think no's coming out of your mouth, yes comes out of your mouth. You're a dangerous man, Jason. But in this particular case, I'm glad he was so persuasive because it's a great privilege for me to have this opportunity to speak to the terrific young next generation leaders of our industry. I do want to start by saying congratulations to all those recipients of the 40 Under 40 Award from Automotive News. I've only been here for 24 hours, but the clear theme so far is that we are going into a time of unparalleled change. And with that change, there's gonna come enormous opportunity and enormous risk. And that's why we need new ways of young leaders like those gathered here today to help us navigate these waters. So the first thing I want to say to you guys is, we cannot afford to have you wait until you have hair my color to take the lead in our industry. We need your leadership now as we start on this journey. So be bold and get ready to take the helm of this wonderful business. It was 40 years ago that I entered the business and 30 years ago that I became a dealer. When I was your age, I had a number of people invest their time and their knowledge in my life. And these people have had an enormous, enormous impact on me. In many ways, I am the sum of these relationships. The cumulative impact of these relationships have changed the direction of my life. Some of these people are in this room today, and I'll be forever grateful for their friendship. They've made my personal journey possible. And I'm gonna talk about some of them along the way in this talk but there are many more I could address. So I wanna take you on a whirlwind tour. You might say it could feel a bit like leaning down to get a sip of water and somebody turns on a fire hydrant. In the next 20 minutes, I wanted to try to capture what I finally learned at 62 that I wish I'd known at 32 when I first became a dealer. And there are three things I wanna talk about what leaders do, 
how they do it, and what enables them to go the distance, to finish the race. And I'm going to try to talk about this in 20 minutes to capture what these extraordinary friends have modeled for me and have demonstrated for me and taught me. So hold on for the next 20 minutes. And because I live in the visual world, the same world all of y'all live in, I have three illustrations to capture this journey. Each of the illustrations are easy to remember. So let's turn on that fire hydrant. First, what do leaders actually do? I want to propose to you that they bring a clear mindset to the organization that sets priorities around three dimensions. I call this preserve, improve, and innovate. And it's the responsibility of leaders to ensure that all three of those things are always happening in their organization. So what does that mean? Well, let's start with preserve. The words literally mean to keep what came before. Leaders must always be asking and thinking about what they need to preserve as they move in the current of the market. And we know this market current is now accelerating at a faster and faster pace. It's not stagnant. And if we don't pay attention to what we need to preserve, it'll get washed away in the current. And that brings us to the most important question that every single leader must answer. What is the core of the organization's DNA? What makes you, you? What distinctive competencies and what's distinctive about the character of your culture? What competencies in your character that if you left those behind, you would no longer be you. Jim Collins wrote a number of years ago in Built to Last that these are your core values, your deepest held beliefs. And if you left them behind, your company would no longer be your company. You would lose your identity. That is, it's the soul of your company. It's your non-negotiables. And Collins says, in times like this of high volatility and change, it's critical to know what you will not change and what you will change. That we must be focused on these core elements, but we must not confuse those with specific strategies or tactics along the way. Because we must be open to changing everything that's not at the core of our business. So do you know the foundational commitments of your company? What are the non-negotiables? Does everybody know those inside the company? And if you're not allocating time and resources to preserve these, they will deteriorate. They don't just go on naturally. They require leaders investing in them. When I was in my early 30s, I had a wonderful mentor. Today he's in the Fortune Hall of Fame. One day when I was speaking with him, I told him that I was sick and tired to hear myself talk about these things. And I wanted to move on to something more important. And he looked at me with a firm eye. And he said, when you get sick and tired of talking about these, Don, go in the bathroom, throw up, wipe off your face, come back out, and start talking about them all over again. And then with a very stern voice from a person who was supposed to care about me, he said, Don, and when you don't want to do that anymore, it's time for you to resign, because you'll no longer be a leader, because that's the calling of leaders. That man passed away last year, but in 30 years, I've never forgotten his words. You must preserve that which is the reason for your existence, Don, and that is your responsibility, period. But of course, preserving the DNA is not all that we do. We must also be about improving. We have to get better at what we have been doing. So what's the first step to improving? You must answer two questions. The first thing you have to say is, where am I now? What is reality? And where do I want to go? I'm here. I don't want to go there. What's the brutal reality? And what's my vision of what I'd like to do in the future? And you must always be able to articulate those in a clear and compelling manner. So clear and compelling that the person at the lowest position in your organization needs to be able to talk about that as well. And we've got to bring urgency to this. Never that been more important than right now in our industry where there's so much change going on, because that current is moving. The best leaders I've been exposed to 
are propelled by a profound vision in which they chase perfection. Yes, I said perfection. They know they'll never get that in this life because perfection is elusive. But I have a great friend, John Bergstrom, who many of y'all know well. He gave me a quote from Vince Lombardi that captures why this chase is so important. Here's the quote. Gentlemen, we're going to relentlessly chase perfection, knowing full well we will not catch it. But we're going to relentlessly chase it because when we do, in the process, we will catch excellence. I'm not remotely interested in being just good. I keep that quote on my desk, and I look at it every single day. And I'm grateful for John Bergstrom because he models that quote every day in his life. And I believe that every single person in our company should have a goal for improvement because everybody can get better at what they do, and that definitely includes me. If I came to your dealerships or to your companies and asked the people who reported to you if they knew what it meant for them to do a great job, to chase perfection, could they articulate that in your store? You know, the work of improvement will never end. Another great friend I met when I was your age, Mike Marooney, we were once the young dealers. He told me long ago that retail is detail, and excellence is about doing 10 things 10% better than everybody else does them. And this requires building habits, and to do this requires enormous energy and focus. I remember being in my early 30s and walking through the stores with Mike and the intensity he brought to his job every single day and the focus on improvement was both challenging and overwhelming at first for me to imagine how he sustained that in that very large store. But that's what made him great. Mike used to say that if you do something well one time, it might be luck. Two times, you're good, but three times, three times, you create a habit of excellence. The world is full of one-hit wonders who are lucky. But sustained excellence is a very rare and special jewel. So go look for people who performed at a level of excellence throughout their careers. I did, and it changed my life. It's the job of a leader to keep lifting your organization's sights higher. We're here, and we want to go to there. Embedded in your culture must be a deep optimism that we can not always do better, and a strong challenge that we must do better. See, leaders set the pace for confidence in organization. Organization will never be more confident than the leaders are. An organization will never be more optimistic than the leaders are. But the challenge of an organization also begins with us. We give permission to everybody else to stretch for more, to reach higher. So how much of your energy is focused every single day on improving every dimension of your business? Do you get excited about the opportunities for improvement? When I go through our dealerships, I have a little checklist of papers we go through, and sometimes guys who are with me are concerned that I'll be upset. I have so many things on that. From my point of view, it's fantastic, because that says we have enormous opportunity for improvement, and we're not even close to peak performance yet. There's so much more we could do to be better. The third side of the triangle, innovation, is imperative in organizations going to flourish in the future. So why is innovation so important? Because innovation changes the value equation in the market. And if you're not participating in the new value, then your portion of the value diminishes, shrinks. In plain English, you make less money. If you want to make more money, create and capture more value. And that only happens through innovation. So we must be reimagining our business today at every point of friction, at every pressure point, and asking, is there a different and better way to create more value in the marketplace? So how do we actually do this? How do we become innovative companies? I'd like to suggest we must bring design thinking into our business, where we're testing things all the time. Small experiments that bubble up everywhere in an organization must be the norm. In our company, we call it the difference between running out of gas in a car and running out of fuel in a plane. 
two very different experiences and outcomes. If you run out of gas in a car, it's a little bit embarrassing and inconvenient, but get over it, and you learn from it. Of course, if you run out of gas in a field and plane, there's not a second chance. The problem is, we often confuse the two in organizations, and we're paralyzed by our fear of failure. We make too big of an issue of running out of gas in the car. In our company, when I come to dealership, I want to know how we ran out of gas in the car this week. Because if we didn't run out of gas in the car, we weren't trying something new. I want people to brag about, we tried this, that didn't work, this did work. Because the only way we can become a place where new ideas are bubbling up all the time is free that up in people. Now, if you're gonna run out of gas or fuel on the plane, I'd, I'd like to be involved. In our company, we think that very few of us in life are good enough to throw a dart and hit a bullseye the first time. We just want to hit the board. Because if we can hit the board, we believe we can keep improving and keep improving and keep improving. And that's what innovation is really all about. Two friends of mine go about this in two different ways, and both of them are extremely successful. Carl Sewell, for over 30 years, has brought enormous innovation in our business in the area of guest experience and guest relationships. He comes out of the gate with a willingness to continually innovate in the area of customer service. And I'm always challenged when I go to visit his dealerships. Actually, it would be more likely to say I go through a grief process. I get there all excited and proud about how well we're doing. Then I get depressed when I see what he's doing. And then I get determined to get better. You see, that's what happens when you rub against people who chase perfection in their life. And Joe Sarah, another great dealer that many of you know, Joe's the single best person I've ever met about adapting and improving ideas. That's a nice way of saying that Joe is a great thief. I can still see Joe 30 years ago. He'd have these little cameras he'd stick on his pockets we'd buy in the airport. He'd come to your dealership taking picture after picture after picture. Anything he saw that he thought would create new value. And here's the amazing thing, challenging thing, and slightly aggravating thing. That Joe came to your stores to take pictures of things you were doing. Six months later, if you went to his store, he not only was doing it, he was doing it better than you were ever doing it. Because Joe just has a nose for innovation and then for ruthlessly uh, implementing that, infl uh, that innovation. So let me summarize the mindset underlying what leaders do in their priorities. They preserve. They intentionally keep doing what they have been doing that which is central to their core DNA. They improve, they do what they have been doing better. And thirdly, they innovate. They do something new they have not done, they create and capture new value. So how do leaders actually do this? Well, about 10 years ago, I went to see a professor I had when I was an undergraduate at UVA. He was retiring after teaching at the Darden School of Business for 40 years. In the last 10 years, he'd been an executive coach to some of the most famous CEOs of the world. And so, because he had a fond memory of me as an undergraduate, he agreed to give me a free afternoon. So we got out on a whiteboard, and I said, just start talking to me about all the things you've learned from these guys. Let's see if we can capture this in a model. And by the end of the afternoon, this is the diagram that we'd come up with to describe how leaders actually lead, how they do it. And this is the next image I want to describe. So once again, they have three sides. They have to be disciplined. They have to be creative. And they have to be overflowing in energy. Every great leader he said they ever met had this kind of endless amount of energy that flowed out of them. And that energy energized their organizations. They were the fuel of energy in the organizations. But they also had to be creative. They were part plumber. They fixed problems, they could solve things, and part artist. They could reimagine things that others couldn't imagine. But if they're creative without being disciplined, then they lack focus. The place is full of great ideas, but actually nothing happens. It's like, in my part of the world, a chicken with his head cut off running around the coop. Lots of energy, not going anywhere. But if they're disciplined without being creative, they're not open to new ideas. They just keep their head down and forge ahead, and this leaves them very, very vulnerable to change. 
Now here's the most interesting thing. Look at the center. What animates them? What gives them the energy at the center of their lives? He said it wasn't status, it wasn't power, it wasn't fear, it wasn't even money. What animated them was love. They loved what they did. They loved their organizations. They loved the people in the organizations, and the people felt that around them. A good friend of mine, who was voted CEO of the world, told me how much, when he was retiring, what he was going to miss was how much he loved the job. He loved the people. He loved what they did every day. What motivated him was not money. I asked him what was it, and he said, it's about building and creating and winning with and through thousands of people. That's what motivates leaders. So here's my professor's advice. On the energy side, take care of yourself emotionally, physically, relationally, and spiritually. The organization needs your energy. You're the governor of the organization. It's not going to go faster than you're ready to go in your life. On the discipline side, write down your goals. Stay focused on what creates value, and don't chase after that which is superficial or trivial. And ask yourself, what distinctive ways do you bring measurable value to your organization? And on the creative side, be open-minded, ask questions, look outside of your organization, and constantly, constantly test new things. Never stop learning. Peter Drucker used to say that's the responsibility of a leader to do what no one else in the organization can do. Do you know what that means for you in your organization? And love what you do. Relish the gift of leading others. It is an enormous personal privilege. Use the authority inherent within your position to actually help others get better. That mentor I mentioned earlier looked at me with that stern eye, also told me one time, the measure of the quality of my leadership would be seen in the improvement of the people I led. Another good friend, Bill Hybels, is always saying, when leaders get better, everybody else gets better. To close, and this is for folks a little bit down the path of life, what elite enables leaders to finish well? well? It's my privilege to have known a lot of people, a number of people lived in their 90s from a variety of walks of life. What helped them go the distance? Well, this is my last picture. It's a picture of a tree. It shows what a coherent life looks like, a coherent flourishing life, where a person can answer three questions in their life. Why, how, and what? Why are the roots of the tree? And they address the issue of purpose. How, how is the trunk? It addresses the issue of character, and the leaves and the fruits of the tree are the what, and they address your activity your work in the world. Here's the key point. It's all you need to remember. The roots feed the trunk and produce the fruit. If you cut the roots, the tree dies. These leaders I've known who finished well have been animated by their purpose and framed by their character. Animated by their purpose and framed by their character. Those who continue to make huge contributions to the very end of their lives were animated by a deep purpose that almost always includes building, creating, enhancing, enabling someone or something that they believe makes a difference in the world. They're propelled and motivated by something they believe in. And the character of the people who've been influential to me are captured in the visual of the trunk of this tree because that's what gives visible substance to them. And these are the kind of people you would want to lead you. They're the kind of people I'd like to follow. And the work they do in the world, they're never passive. They don't sit on the sidelines like a spectator. They're always in the game, constantly setting new goals, pleased but never satisfied, always stretching to get better, and always looking forward, never looking back. Another friend of mine went to see Peter Drucker when Drucker was 90 years old. And he asked him, what keeps you going? And he looked at my friend who was 70 and said, are you kidding me? Here's 10 books I still want to write and he was 90 years old. Their eyes are always set on the future horizon. So to the young leaders in our audience, a friend of mine who's a counselor who works with high-capacity people, 
says that it's critical for you to bring this coherence to your life by your late 40s. That is, what you love, what you think, who you want to be, and what you do need to be integrated. They need to be connected in your life. In her years of counseling young leaders, she says that those who have not focused on developing those by their late 40s either crash and burn or flame out. Here are the facts. Our industry cannot afford for you to flame out. You're too important, and we need your leadership. So pay attention. Pay attention to those things as your years unfold. And one last thing, who you do this with matters. I had the incredible privilege to begin working with my father, and now I have the great gift of working with my son. And beginning in college, and all through my career, I've traveled through life with an incredible, incredible group of friends. I've mentioned a few of them along the way, but there are many others. And these friends have done three things for me. They've challenged me, they've cared about me, and they've believed in me. I would encourage you to cultivate those kinds of friends. Your life will be different if you do. So our industry needs more leaders like I've described, like the leaders I've been privileged to have known in my life. And frankly, the world needs more leaders like this. And you, you're the best young leaders in the largest industry in the world. You have an incredible platform to make a difference. There's not a single person here that I know who can project or predict with absolute certainty about the future of our industry. And if you can, I'd like to give you my net worth and we'll go down to the tables this afternoon. But here's the very good news. There is a very high chance that industry is going to be changed. But you are the folks who are going to be changing it. You're going to be at the center of that change, and you're going to make that change happen as long as you stay here and, and remember the things we've talked about today. It's going to be incredible change. Frankly, I wish I was your age all over again. So let me leave you with this. Be wise about what needs to be preserved. Be relentless about what needs to be improved. And open your imagination to innovation that creates new value as we go forward. You're going to have a great adventure and a great time. Go get them. Thank you. Well, I'll ask you a question, and I guess you'll only have one answer. <laughs> How about a few questions? <laughs> Incredible. Well, fun to do. Incredible opening. Thank fun you so do. much. This Thank gets you. NADA off on right. the right foot, I'd say. Well, it's exciting to have these young leaders here. It is. And so many friends. You, you told me an interesting story when I asked you the question of whether you would do this. Right. What did you say? Um, remind me. Well, you... <laughs> <laughs> and I'll, I'll write. You, you've asked me so many things recently that I've tried I, to say no to. You, <laughs> I said yes to. <laughs> you wanted to... Give back yeah. to this industry. Yeah. The fact of the matter is, uh, my whole life has been shaped by this, this industry. I went to my first car auction when I was four years old. And I looked and said, all the people have made a difference in my life. I mentioned a few of them. And this year, in our family Christmas letter we send out to our family friends, I remember writing the last paragraph where I said, all of a sudden I realized this year that I'm the same age that these men who gave their life to me so much were and it's time for me to get going. Time for me to get going. Yeah. Time to give back. You, you mentioned all of your personal mentors, many of whom are in the room today, yep. which is a wonderful thing. Yep. How are you trying to be a mentor now going forward? So inside of an organization, I have uh, a number of blocks of time just set out for meetings with young people all the way through the time, breakfasts, lunch, dinners along the way. I also meet in our communities and throughout the state, uh, young leaders in the state of North Carolina because I think that young leaders make a real big a difference. We need them desperately from all walks of life. So part of that is to say, tell me your story. What would you like to talk about? And I'm an open book, ask any questions. As a goal setter, uh, as I know you are, sitting right. every year writing down what your goals right. are going to be right. for the year, how difficult is it to set goals in an environment that changes so rapidly, or so it seems it's yeah. changing rapidly? So that's a great question. So it's much more difficult to have five-year goals anymore. So we are looking at things right in front of us that we know that say, uh, 
This we know is not where it needed to be. It's here, it needs to go to there. How do we do that? And then the other part of the goal is actually about going out and visiting folks to learn and say, let's open our minds to what's happening around to make sure that we're not too disciplined, shut down on something when things are happening around us. And rewrite those goals yep. you know, every yep. so often, yep. right? Is it harder to be young in this business now than it was when you were young in this well, business? Well, it's certainly different. Yeah. You know, it was a, a more uh, wild west world we in the world we live in. I think about the difference between car auctions today and car auctions then. Uh, sales processes, practices, everything's different along the way. Uh, so there's certain parts that I miss, but there are other parts today that are like incredibly exciting as we learn how to deliver new value to guests in a new way that I think offer uh, really wonderful opportunities to reimagine this great business. And this, this reimagined great business has been challenged from others on the outside to say, well, you know, maybe young people don't want to go into the right, business. Right, right, right. So we, we're still fighting some yeah, of that, yeah. right? So here's the fact of the matter also. I love this business. I love the people in this room. And I believe the people in this room are going to adapt. So when I look at the folks coming from outside and want to come into our business, for me, my challenge is, and, and partly began with a conversation Jason and I had before about, I, we need to wake up and to say, this is our business. Let's make sure that we don't give away the value that could be created to anybody else outside. And part of that means inviting younger people in the business and allowing them a lot of different kinds of opportunities and opening the door up for them to listen to their input and to attempt things that maybe I'm not comfortable doing, but we go back to, okay, is that running out of gas in the car or the plane? Is it running out of gas in the car? Let's give it a shot. And there are some who have given up on a certain generation, which we won't even mention that generation's right. name, right? But I, I think you probably have a different take on that. Yeah, so we actually love that. We think that uh, all this young energy, a lot of it needs to be focused. They need to have the opportunities to express that. And uh, it means that I have to be open to uh, kind of giving up range for that. We do have to pay attention more to life work balance that probably I did. The nine to nine, bell to bell world <laughs> does not exist anymore in that space. But you know what, that's actually healthy. Yeah. How do you stay inspired? Well, a lot of it happens because people around me. You know, I mentioned like being with Carl Stuhl, Mike Marooney, Joe Sarah, John Bergstrom. These are inspiring people in life who are always reaching. And so it's tough to be flat around them along the way. I do pay attention to uh, today, this stage of life, making sure I'm being as healthy as I can, I exercise as much as I can, and then be with people who are aspiring. You know, the fact of the matter is, like I mentioned with my friend going to meet with Peter Drucker, Drucker at 90 years old was aspiring to write 10 books still. <laughs> There's something about the visual for our industry is a great way. The relationship in size between a windshield and a rear view mirror. That's how life should be approached. We should be looking out ahead and imagining what are possibilities out there instead of looking back all the time. There's a reason why I persuaded you to do this, and you've just illustrated that for us today. Thank you very much, Don Flo, for being Thanks, here. Thanks, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.